successes in what another person, when God uses someone else's talents to advance the cause of Christ. Uh, in, in my first church, I, I had a man who, uh, God, I hope I'm not stepping on toes here. I've just been hearing blessed singing all week. But I had a man uh, that uh, was the song leader that uh, couldn't uh, carry a tune in a bucket, as I say. <laughs> Have you ever watched one of them singing shows where they'll come on there and they think they can really sing and everybody's going, <laughs> they really have been told that they can sing. If you've got a kid and they can't sing, don't you lie to them because you're going to embarrass them. Like, sure. Amen. That's good advice. You're going to embarrass them. And we used to have people want to sing solos and we'd come up with every reason in the world not to let them. But sometimes they just need to be told, that is not your gift. <laughs> God love you and I'm being truthful with you. But he couldn't sing, and the church began to grow, and God sent a lot of talent in, a lot of musical talent. In fact, one family came, much like this family, that the whole, the, all of them could play and sing, and they began to, to, to add to the, the team, and what long for they were helping lead some, and oh, he was so mad, he couldn't see straight on, you could see it on his God was growing the church. People were getting saved. The place was busting apart at the seams. And this guy was mad because he wasn't leading the singing and he couldn't sing in the first place. <laughs> Jealousy. He told me if I let him sing one more time, he wasn't coming back to church. So I was sure to put him on the schedule the next week. Uh, I'm sorry, God. <laughs> that wasn't very kind, was it? Love don't threaten either. I'll say that. Sometimes I wonder if there's not more jealousy in the American church than there is in the world. You know? Love's not jealous. Love does not boast. It's not, it's not prideful. It, it doesn't parade itself around. It doesn't it, it's it's not a a windbag, you know, it's not like having to tell everybody all the time how great it is. Love does not have to do that. Uh, <laughs> And so, uh, well, love, actually, the opposite of that, we should give Jesus all the glory all the time. Yes. Uh, all the time. Yes. Good sermon, Pastor. Thanks be to God. Good sermon. Praise Jesus. Glory to God. Yes. Good song. Good service. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Let's get used to saying that. Yes. Amen. Amen. Give him the glory. Yes. <clears throat> Love's not error. It's humble. Considers others better than itself. It's what love does. That's what it does. Have you ever seen a wheat field? You ever drove past a wheat field? Yeah, you ever noticed in a wheat field the higher the stalk and the more grain at the top of the stalk, the more fruit, the, the closer to the ground it lays. Wheat stalks that are full of fruit have been in a posture of service. You understand? That's, that's the idea. The more fruit you're bearing for the kingdom, the lower you're going to consider yourself. Yeah. Love's not rude. Not rude. Love doesn't have an agenda. It doesn't seek its own. It doesn't. It, it doesn't come to, to, to the meeting or where, where decisions are being made with its own personal opinion and how that's going to run the day or it's going to get mad. That's not what love does. It doesn't do that. It, it's on the team. It, 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 it strives for unity. You know what? For us to have revival, I think I've harkened on this this week, but for the church to experience revival in America, there will have to be unity first. And God's not going to come and force us to get along with each other. He's already given us Jesus. He's given us the Holy Spirit. The unity, it should already be there. God will never come and bring unity. But when unity comes, God will show up. Yeah. But it won't ever come when people are seeking their own. There'll be no unity when individuals have agendas. I can't tell you how many times in pastoral leadership over the years that I didn't get my way in a board meeting. God taught me real quick, the board is a team. And you're not always going to get your way. And when you don't, don't make it about you. Agree, because I work through the unified voice of the whole. And when you don't get your way, you leave with your arms around everybody and rejoice in what I'm doing through the whole. 
Right. Yeah. Don't try to manipulate the process with your agenda. That's right. Love is not provoked. You know, I think this one has uh, has done a lot of damage in the church over the years because really what it means is love is not offended. We're, we're too easily offended sometimes. Yes, sir. You know, just the least little old thing. What is it? The, the reason we don't win more people to Jesus is because we're too offended by people. They don't look like us and act like us right out of the gate, you know. And you know, I want to I give some good news. I see some of that dissipating in the church today. I do, I do. I see some of that uh, going away. One of my best friends in high school, and some of you know my story, when my grandmother would drag me to church against my will on Sunday mornings as a teenager, often I'd have two or three friends that I'd run with me. You know, if I had to go, and my mind may have to go too. <laughs> and a couple of those friends, oh man, I mean, one guy named Kenny Brown, he was one of my closest friends from like 12 to 16. And he had hair down all the way down his back, and a nose ring, and long earrings, and he had about 15, he had tattoos, I mean, this guy, what they didn't know is the guy didn't have a family, I mean, he just, he'd been abandoned as a child, had a rough life, but they treated him like dirt in the church. He never felt more, more uncomfortable anywhere else in the world. You know, the church ought to be the safest places for anybody to go. It ought to be the least judgy. I go to Planet Fitness. I told somebody uh, in my town in Cracker Barrel, right across the street from Planet Fitness. And Planet Fitness says, no judgment zone. So that means I can leave there and go straight to Cracker Barrel. It don't matter who's looking, right? And so, uh, <laughs> now my wife's going to judge me if she catches me doing that. So don't put that on the video. But anyway, <laughs> I'd run on the treadmill for 20 minutes and go eat biscuits for 30, all right? <laughs> I feel like that sort of way well, that evens itself out, don't you? And so, but, but the, the church, I, I say that because Planet Fitness, what does they say? No judgment, no judgment, no judgment zone. The church ought to be the no judgment zone. Yeah. Man, anybody that looks any way, that's living any kind of lifestyle, ought to be able to come in here and sit on the front row and nobody do anything but put their arm around them and try to point them to the cross. Amen. Amen. Truth. Do we expect people, let you know that in our culture is the most unchurched society in, this, in the history of this nation? There are people in our communities that have never been inside a church. They've never heard the gospel. You might think, how is that? It is so. Okay. There's all kinds of research that proves it so. They have no idea who Jesus is. Right. And if they find their way in here, Instead of looking down our noses at them, we ought to be pointing them to Jesus. By the way, my friend Kenny uh, drove his, uh, ended up in an accident at 16 years old and died in a helicopter on the way to the hospital. Unsaved. Sat in church with me from the time he was 13, you know, at least two or three times a month. I hate to think of the blood that's going to be on the church's hands for that. Yes. I'm glad Jesus didn't get offended, aren't you? Yes. Beam me up, Dad. These people are so ungrateful for all I'm doing for them. Glad he didn't say that. What do we do? Well, they didn't talk to me. They didn't. They looked at me. Well, so what? Who cares? Do you care about them? I'm glad some people don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Real glad. <laughs> they look at you funny, just look back at them funny. You know, I'm smiling way. I don't know. Make it fun. Love them. Love them. Had some little old lady stay mad at me in one church. I'm telling too many stories, aren't I? They'd sit out there like, ever, ever. <laughs> They'd get up and I'd be shaking hands to back me, trying to go way around. I'd run over and catch me. He <laughs> says you heat cold with fire. Now that could be fun if you do it right. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got to learn how to do that, though. You know, I've had a lot of years of experience at heaping coals of fire. But love's kind, right? 
He calls them in. Be kind. Love does. Love thinks no evil. Doesn't dwell on getting even. It's not vindictive. We are sometimes. Yeah. But love's not. Jesus is not. Love doesn't laugh at others when they're down. Right. Love never wishes bad for another person. It doesn't kick people when they're down. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, Paul says, but it rejoices in truth. You know, you, you know what? As a young pastor, I'm just, I hope I'm just being vulnerable and it's helping you in some of these stories. I, I can't tell you how many times somebody that was perceived to be a leader in the church told me some kind of coarse joke on a golf course. And as a pastor, you're serving these people and the temptation is to laugh along. But buddy, God zapped my heart and said, don't you laugh. And I quit laughing. It became an issue with one guy. And I said, I just pulled him aside and said, I'm never going to laugh at that. I'm never going to laugh at it because it's wrong. Right. It's racist or sexist or whatever. And it's not loving and it's not godly. Yeah. And if you think racist jokes are funny, then you've got hatred in your heart. Yeah. That's all there is to it. Man, I don't know. I, I, I've almost stopped watching television. i got just a few shows that I like. Because I can't find anything that's good for my spirit. On that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, there's some stuff. I'm sure there are some things. But it's you got to really look to find it, don't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? Because almost all of it rejoices in iniquity. Right. Yep. And if there is a good part to it, you got to go through all the iniquity to get to the good part. Right. Love bears all things. You know what that essentially means? It means love covers a multitude of sins. It just forgives people before they even ask to be forgiven. Or if they never ask. It just doesn't carry the record, you know? It just doesn't keep up with it. It doesn't keep a, a list. It, in fact, it does the opposite. Love builds like a protective umbrella over people who need love the most. That's what love does. I mean, if your kids are lost, and I've dealt with this in my own household, if your kids are lost and going down the wrong path, you, you don't come down on them with a bunch of pressure. You love them. That's right. yeah. Put my son to bed drunk. With tears in my eyes. <laughs> Not anymore, praise God. Amen. I can tell you what I wanted to do, though. I wanted to <laughs> the Lord wouldn't let me. Love well, believes all things. Yes. Yes. Some people may not believe it, but I believe this hundred and 15-year-old denomination can see the fire of the Holy Spirit fall on it again and become Amen. a movement for the Holy Spirit that transforms society again. I believe that. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Love hopes all things. Hope is what our society needs more than anything else. Now, with all that in mind, can, can you just, let's go back, can you just imagine Paul preaching that in court. Wow. That's, that's a transforming message. Yeah. Man, that, that, that'll light the fire under you, right? I mean, it, it does me. I get chills every time I even read the passage. I mean, what do you think they did at first when this little guy was standing on a, a street corner proclaiming, love never fails. Trust God. He loves you. I'll tell you what they did. They laughed at him. They cussed him. As they, as they went on their way with their prost temple prostitutes. That's what they did. They drank their wine and they blasphemed him. Told him he was foolish. But 
finally Paul says, love endures all. So what did he do? He just kept on going. All right. Pastors, keep on going. Amen. Don't you quit. Our church leaders, you leaders of the church, don't you quit. This society needs you more right now than it's ever needed. Yeah. Yes. There's more untruth filtering into people's lives right now than has since the beginning of American society. Don't quit. Endure all things. Because that's what love does. It never fails. It never fails. Apart from such external things, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, there is the daily pressure on me of the concern for all the churches. I can tell you right now, that statement can belong to me. Yeah. Paul lived this, and you can live it too. Nice. Because he was a man, just like we are. And if God could empower him to live it in the day and age that he lived in, then God can empower us to live it right. in the day and age that we live in. Could you play something for me, brother? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand with me tonight. I want you to look here at me. I want you to insert your name. Love suffers long. Brian suffers long. And is patient. Put your name in there. Brian is kind. Brian does not envy. Brian does not parade himself. Brian is not puffed up. He's not proud. Brian does not behave rudely. Brian does not seek his own. Brian is not provoked. Brian thinks no evil, and Brian does not rejoice in iniquity. He rejoices in truth. Brian bears all things, and Brian believes all things. Brian hopes all things, and Brian endures all things. Brian never fails. I want that to be true about me. And if there's any part of it that's not true about you, then tonight you can make it true about you. Would you bow your heads with me? As my brother plays, we're just going to seek the Lord. If you need to pray, I want you to come.